now I would like to ask our distinguished guest Nobel laureate, uh, Tim Hunt, to deliver his lecture. Thanks. Yeah. Comes the technical bit. Yes. Pull that out of there. Okay. And this is the key moment. I bet it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. okay. Yes, amazing. <laughs> wow. You have no idea how astonishing that is, actually. <laughs> so uh, it's a real pleasure to be back here again. And um, I have some very good friends in Seged now. Actually, the first time I came here, I think it. Uh, there was a meeting on plant cell cycles. At the, and I can't remember when it was. It must have been very, maybe in the early 90s. I mean, it was only just after the end of the communist era. And I remember that um, there were currency exchange regulations and things. It, you know, it was quite complicated getting in and out. And you had to. Anyway. So that was my first exposure, and more recently you've, 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 you've seen where I've been, and um, uh, this is really a nice place, and you're, you're lucky to be here. I'm even luckier myself. So, um, yeah, this, this is a beach where I like to walk um, because it's a seaweed farm. And um, actually, I brought some of the seaweed, and we we had it for dinner. <laughs> it's called umi budo, <laughs> sea grapes. It's a grape, and um, that's that's not what grows here. This is just uh, the standard sort of green seaweed that you put in if you ever had Japanese soup. You know, it's that sort of rather slimy stuff. That's what it is. And uh, this, is the, this is the season. So it's uncovered at low tide and covered at high tide. And the, just behind there is the, the, the reef, and you can, it's very nice to snorkel there and see all the fishes. Uh, it's good. So that's, that's where... Um, and our house is somewhere just off to the left up, up here. And it's, it's a lovely, absolutely wonderful house. It's the most luxurious house I've ever lived in. Anyway... Um, so I'm going to tell you about um, making a discovery, and I'm going to I really want to emphasize the curious path that, at any rate, in my experience, science usually takes. Um, and I think I should uh, also mention that I think my, my wife has a very low opinion of me. Probably rightly so, <laughs> she knows me pretty well. <laughs> and she says, you know, you should think of me as the people's laureate. And what she means by that is that if I can win a Nobel Prize, anybody can win a Nobel <laughs> Prize. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's a very good ambition to have. So le let me tell you about my history. So I grew up in Oxford, and my dad's office was in this building here. I don't think it was on the top floor. I think it was the next, next floor down. And, and, and here he is reading a book, which you can see is in Greek if you're sitting in the front. And he was a kind of medieval historian, but his job was actually called the Keeper of the Western Manuscripts. And what are the Western Manuscripts? Well, they're not the Eastern Manuscripts. And um, he, his, his sort of research topic, he, he was what's called a paleographer. He understood ancient medieval handwriting. And his great discovery was when he was reading a, a book and he realized that the marginal comments were written by the poet Petrarch because he knew what Petrarch's handwriting looked like. Now, I don't think many of us would be able to do that, but that, that was his sort of eureka moment. And um, actually, it's sort of interesting that the, the techniques that he and his colleagues used for... They were really interested in the spread of knowledge in the Middle Ages. You know, when was Aristotle rediscovered and sort of science started again? 
And the way you did this was by following transcriptional errors in the manuscript. So that in those days, of course, the way that books were made, that monks wrote them by hand. And every so often, a monk would make a typographical error because, you know, they fell asleep or, or whatever. And the point is that then that book was used to copy in some other monastery down the line, and, by, and because they were accurately copied, these mistakes were accurately copied, and so by tracing back the history of those mistakes, it's exactly like mutations, same principle, or, or like the evolution of languages. I mean, there's quite a lot of human things work, work like that, so this is very familiar to bi biologists. So he was really a sort of proto-biologist, but he wasn't a scientist at all. He knew Latin and Greek, and I was no good at Latin and Greek, so couldn't do that. So the first th really important thing I think I did, this is me, <laughs> at the age of... So I've often wondered what... I, this is an incredibly beautiful woman. And, you know, did she... Did, this is... I was really proud of this. This was the Oxford University Dramatic Society, you know, and I was a fairy, uh, along with two other boys. I think we were about seven years old at the time, something like that. So this is my first experience of acting, and actually, uh, throughout my school, from then on and through my school career, I f a acting was uh, very... Uh, I, I liked it a lot. I didn't think I was terribly good at it, but I, I did it quite a lot. And I found it very... It was always very um, confidence-boosting, because it's so terrifying. And then it comes in very handy for occasions like this, because you're used to performing in front of a... An, an audience and sort of relaxing and doing your thing is, 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 is so this is a useful experience but again not something obviously in the curriculum I mean you wouldn't sort of say oh you must act because otherwise you won't be able to give a talk in public but it's not bad training so you know these sort of unintentional consequences I think are interesting so the, the, the first inkling that I was really going to be a scientist came from because I enjoyed the science lessons so much at the, at the Dragon School, and we were taught by this guy here. This is a, he didn't look like this at the time. This, he was, this was taken when he was quite old. But Gert was an absolutely wonderful teacher, and he taught us that science was fun, and he taught us also that science, when you understood it properly, was very, very simple. And he was really good at sort of reducing things to their, their essential and not making them overcomplicated. And I think that was an extremely valuable lesson. And one of the most difficult things I think I found as a young scientist, you know, you tend to try to be too clever. And I realized that the, the, practically the only thing that Nobel laureates have in common, I think, is that they do like to try to get to the bottom of things and keep it very simple, because none of us are very clever, actually. You know, and if you can't really understand it properly, then, you know, it's no good. So you getting, but getting to that underlying simplicity is a struggle, as I will illustrate. So along the way, um, you know, what other things helped me become a scientist? Well, one is that I liked reading scientific biographies, and I think the first one that I read was of Marie Curie, who, of course, won two Nobel Prizes, um, one for chemistry and one for physics. Um, and her daughter wrote a wonderful biography of her, and there have been subsequently many great biographies, and uh, her story is very inspiring, actually, whether you're a boy or a girl. I mean, it's, 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 it's fantastic. She was one hell of a determined young woman, and a pretty tough old woman, too, I suspect. <laughs> um, and then I discovered that I'd won a school science prize along the way, uh, I think in I forget, 1956 or 57, something like that, and with that prize, I chose a book the life of Alexander Fleming, um, the discoverer of penicillin, nicely illustrated on this thing that I found on the, on the internet. So here are bacteria, you streak the bacteria from left to right, and here are three sensitive strains, one insensitive strain, and the penicillin uh, mold. And you can see that the penicillin is making something that inhibits the growth of bacteria here, but if we have one of those resistant strains that we heard about this morning so beautifully, then of course, you know, the penicillin doesn't do any good. Actually, the way that these bacteria resist the penicillin, they just break it down. They make an enzyme that hydrolyzes the penicillin. 
So that's pretty cool, and that was sort of Fleming's discovery, but actually Fleming was a useless chemist, absolutely hopeless. He was a really, really good microbiologist, but he didn't know the first thing about chemistry, and it took these gentlemen, particularly I think the real hero here is a guy, Norman Heatley, who I doubt whether many of you would have heard of. I actually met him just before he died. Um, unfortunately, he was um, suffering from dementia, didn't have much memory left at the time. And I, I asked him, he, he did his PhD in Cambridge with Joseph Needham, who I knew slightly, um, because he was the reader in biochemistry for many years when I was a, a, an undergraduate there. And I said to Heatley, I said, so you did your PhD in Cambridge with um, Joseph Needham, did you? I may have, he said. <laughs> And um, chain, uh, he, so Heatley was the guy who discovered how to get the penicillin out of the culture medium. It was very simple, actually. You um, extracted it with water and then re-extracted it with an organic solvent, changing the pH. I mean, and, and he also worked out how to grow the mold and how to assay the penicillin. And it was chain who did the really key experiment because. Um, uh, Heatley had made about two grams of a dirty brown powder, which was probably about you know, maybe 5% penicillin. And this was the entire world stock of penicillin. And Chain took two normal mice and injected one with the one gram of this two grams and the other with the other gram of the two grams. Uh, when Flory found out about this, he was absolutely furious. How could you waste all this precious material? But Chain, I think, was absolutely right because he injected it all into these two mice. So what happened? Well, one possibility is the mice would have immediately dropped down dead, which would have been the end of the penicillin project. But the mice did not drop down dead. They lived. So this is a wonderful example of the negative control, right? Before he tried to see whether he could cure a sick mouse, he made sure that he didn't kill a well mouse. So I, I'm absolutely 100% with, with, with Chain on, on this one. And once they'd done that, they knew it was going to be good because these mouse had received enough to, you know, to kill a 10 trillion billion bacteria. Uh, Flory was a very peculiar man and he was the boss. Um, and his biography, which I've also read, is an awful story, actually, I, because, of, uh, because of the way he treated his wife, or rather, it's a very interesting story. Anyway, I won't go into that, because it, 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 but it's... it's, it's ooh. <laughs> anyway, these guys won the Nobel Prize, and poor old Heatley, who was in some ways the hero, didn't. Uh, they, life, you know, life's not fair. Uh, so, uh, as I say, that was an inspiring story to me as a, when I was sort of your age-ish. Uh, and along the way, uh, one of the advantages in being in Oxford was that there were these things called extramural lectures. They'd take place in January and February, I think, and people from the university would come and talk, and anybody from the public could go and listen. And the first one, I think it must have been in 1959, was about evolution. Here's Darwin's first famous first tree, and, and that was interesting. I liked it a lot. The second one was about the biological effects of ionizing radiation. And um, I, 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 as a result of that, I read a, a book called Brighter Than a Thousand Suns, which was about the, the, the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and the, the effects it had on the population there, which is, a, again, a searing uh, story. And uh, let us not forget who is the only nation who has dropped atom bombs <laughs> on anybody. Yeah. And then the third year uh, was uh, somebody from the biochemistry department. Now, and I thought this was really, really interesting, and I was fascinated by all these compounds zooming this way and that way. But I was puzzled by one thing. I mean, you know, you look at these, these fantastic biochemical diagrams, you say, well, you know, it's, all these things are going on in, in aqueous solution inside all of us all the time. Um, well, what's regulating them? And in those days, um, nobody knew. So, uh, and when I was an undergraduate, the first inklings of how things were controlled uh, came out. So I, and I was pretty good at chemistry. I had a very good chemistry teacher. I was terribly lucky. I mean, 
Summerhoff, who I showed you, he had a PhD. I think all my teachers had PhDs. They really knew what they were talking about. That's I realize in retrospect, it seemed natural at the time because they all did, but I realize in retrospect it's not so common actually. And uh, one thing about a good teacher is that they actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> So, um, because I grew up in Oxford, and uh, Cambridge is the place to go and do uh, science, it has been for a long time. This is Alexander Pope writing a, 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 what was supposed to be an epitaph for Newton. Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. <laughs> So, Cambridge has a long tradition of, uh, of excellent uh, scientists, although I guess, I mean, Newton was really more of a mathematician in a way than he was a physicist, although he was a bloody good physicist too, and, you know, arguably one of the greatest scientists of all time, um, from the clarity of his vision. But not only Newton, there were some other pretty good people in, in Cambridge. Maxwell was actually the first professor of physics, and his equations, which I simply don't understand, explain the relationship between electricity and, and magnetism. And unfortunately, my, my I, I wasn't, a, I was a poor, I would have loved to have been a great physicist, but I'm not. And I realized that sort of the school physics stopped well before Maxwell, because Maxwell was actually a, a very, very good mathematician, and his, his maths is not easy to follow at all. I mean, there are things in it which I certainly don't, don't understand. So it's, it's, you know, people say you should always try and explain science to the layman, but actually there are some things which are bloody hard to understand. You know, you practically need a PhD in order to properly understand them. And so I, I'm not ashamed to say that physics is largely a closed book to me, but I love it. And I think, you know, it's, it's sort of a very different kind of science from biology, actually. And then, you know, we have Rutherford and uh, his boys who solved the problem of the atom. I mean, the original atom looks like this, a sort of flat structure. And by 1925, that was 1913 model, Bohr's model of the, of the atom. By 1925, we have this sort of spherical model. It's interesting that you still tend to see atoms drawn like this, which is very far from the truth. Uh, if you think about it. And if, if hydrogen atoms were really flat, the world would be a very different place from how it actually is. And it was really the heirs of this. What's, uh, uh, Crick was a, a, a physicist um, working on the structure of proteins, and then Watson came along and persuaded him to work on on, on DNA, and uh, I'll show you them in, in, in just a second. And then Kendra and Perutz worked on protein structures, and this was all happening, I mean, this was practically happening in, in, in fact, Kendra and Perutz happened in, in my, as I was an undergraduate there. And one of the interesting things about being in a place like Cambridge was that, you know, if you were feeling confident, um, this was, this sort of history, this, this amazing legacy was, you could, something to be proud of, but of course, if you're not feeling very, you know, and things often don't go very well, it was, it was rather an intimidating burden because there was no conceivable way that you could match the achievements of these people, and and it was a bit depressing, frankly. But still, we went on. So here is is Watson and Crick, and you know, I had the very good fortune to to know and converse with with both of them, and. Um, very interesting, uh, and here they are having just solved the structure of, 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 of DNA, famous photograph. And here is uh, Ken Drew, and he's just solved the structure of myoglobin. I like, I like this model because it's called the sausage model, and you can see why it's called a sausage model. And you can also see that actually Ken Drew didn't at that time quite know where the chains went, right? There's some, something funny is happening here. This is how it looks now, how you would draw it. And he didn't actually know what the connectivity of the chains was because his data weren't quite good enough. But I show this because uh, myoglobin, which is what makes m meat red and tuna fish red and your muscles red, uh, there is red because of this group here, the, the um, tetrapyral ring of heme and the iron at its center. And you can see how it nestles in a fold in the in, in the protein. So uh, I 
passed my exams and was accepted as a graduate student, and the problem was what to work on. And my first project was a complete failure and didn't work. Um, and I won't, I won't go into that. And I got the second project after about six months of abject failure um, by going to this meeting, the first scientific meeting I ever went to. And it was all about hemoglobin, structure and function and synthesis of hemoglobin. And two talks in particular, I think, uh, influenced me strongly. The talk by Henry Borsig, rather peculiar, early development of the sea urchin egg compared with erythropoiesis. Well, sea urchin eggs and red cells have very little in common, except they're both round. Um, you know, and, but, but he did teach me that uh, there was a coordination between heme and globin synthesis. That is to say, if you remove iron from cells that are making hemoglobin, they, they can't make the protein. And that's odd because, um, sure, I mean, obviously they can't make hemoglobin because you need iron to make hemoglobin. But why would you stop synthesis of the protein when you stop synthesis of the prosthetic group? And that was the question which was addressed by this guy here, Vernon Ingram, the discoverer of the, the fault in uh, sickle cell anemia. And uh, Ingram proposed the following. He sh showed data, actually, which purported to show that the, if you starved cells making hemoglobin of iron, what happened was that they formed a Q. Because what was going to happen was that the ribosomes would start at the beginning of the message and go down it, and they sort of make a protein as they go. You have to imagine a protein coming out here, which folds up as it comes out. And then at some point, it would make the thing, that fold of protein that's going to bind the heme group. And what he said was that if there was no heme there, the ribosomes would stop at that point and wait for the heme to arrive. Wow, what a great idea. How did the ribosomes know whether there was heme there or not? And da -da -da -da. So we went back and thought this was really exciting stuff and told our friends in, in, in the lab, who then, being cleverer than me, pointed out that actually the data said exactly the opposite, and that Ingram had utterly misinterpreted his own data. And we realized, when I say we, it's uh, these two people, Tony Hunter and Lou Reichart. And Lou knew how to make, these are rabbit reticulocytes, the cells that are making hemoglobin. They're quite easy to make by making rabbits anemic. Um, we realized we could think of a better way of doing the experiment than Ingram. I mean, I can't reconstruct now how I... I mean, it seems like an absurd thing to imagine that you could do better than a very fine scientist like Vernon Ingram, but th we did, and we had the confidence uh, to do it. So Tony and I basically collaborated on our, our research, and here's Tony eluting radioactive peptides from a 2D, 2D gel. That's what we did. And along the way, that was in 65, I went to another meeting, this time in northern Greece in Thessaloniki, where I ran into this guy here, who was also interested in this problem of how heme and globin synthesis were coordinated. And th the problem is beautifully shown in this data. I think this must be one of my experiments, actually. And you can see that we measure radioactivity incorporated into protein up the side and time along the bottom. And in order to measure rates, you have to take successive time points. That's pretty obvious. One doesn't, one's not enough. And what happens if you leave out the heme, uh, protein synthesis starts off okay at the same rate as it would in the control, but then it curls over and dies. Here's the control. If you have heme, it, it, your protein synthesis carries on for a nice long time. Importantly, if you add back the heme to a thing that's starving of heme, protein synthesis is recovered. So this is a reversible control. So what is regulating globin synthesis here? That was the, that was the thing. Uh, so, uh, Tony and I actually showed that actually uh, ribosomes did not form cues, although we also showed in an important control experiment that if they did form cues, which we could artificially impose on them, we could detect them. So our methods were okay, but um, they didn't normally form cues, e whether the heme was present or not. Um, and What's going wrong here? Well, the answer is, I've shown you a polysome, is that some inhibitor accumulates in the absence of heme, which blocks ribosomes getting onto the start of the message. So you end up with naked messenger RNA and lots of free ribosomes. And I'll, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll come, come back to that in a while. So what is it, what is this inhibitor and how does it, 
How does it work? Well, that wasn't so easy to figure out, and I kept on doing the same basic experiments, same, getting the same basic result. And um, by this time, this is when now I'm, I go back, I f get my PhD and go back to New York because I liked it there a lot. And, um, but I said they made very little scientific progress, and I, I sort of started having doing things on the side, and one of the things I wanted to do was to map genes in polio virus, which I thought I could do using the same kind of methods that Tony and I had used earlier to map the cues or not cues in, in, in um, hemoglobin synthesis. And uh, I can't remember why I thought I... Well, I mean, the main thing was that there were people there with polio virus and who worked on polio, so why not try and see if you could map the genes? So I. I, I got some polio virus from Ellie and made the RNA from it, and uh, it didn't translate, which is quite right, because actually red cells don't get polio virus. So I then thought uh, it would be good to get some cytoplasm from a polio virus infected cell, because they clearly were making polio virus, so the missing factor must be present there. This is all absolutely logical and, and true, but when I got the infected poliovirus uh, stuff, it turned out to inhibit protein synthesis. And what was interesting, the inhibition was exactly the same as when you left the heme out. So that's sort of peculiar. I mean, wh what do lack of heme and the presence of poliovirus have in common? Not a lot. In fact, nothing. Um, moreover, uh, this, it was clear from working out, that eventually we discovered that the, it was what was in this poliovirus um, infected cytoplasm was double-stranded RNA and the inhibition was spectacularly sensitive. One molecule of poliovirus double-stranded RNA was enough to inhibit synthesis by 10 million ribosomes. It had to be catalytic. Um, so that was also a, a, an, Im, an important lesson. And then I did another collaboration with um, a, a woman called Nechama Kosawa, a visitor from, from Israel. And Nechama's husband was an organic chemist, and they, they were interested in glutathione and its oxidation. So here is glutathione, a sort of anti cellular antioxidant. Each one of your cells has about two millimolar glutathione, reduced glutathione in it. And, um, if, if, if it gets oxidized, then it turns into this compound here. And I found, it was, we originally thought, so we added a compound that it oxidized the glutathione, and we thought it was the lack of the protective glutathione that was causing the trouble. And one, one evening, I sort of realized, thinking about it, we didn't really know that. Could it be that it was actually the oxidized glutathione that was the inhibitor? rather than the lack of the, it was the presence of bad stuff rather than absence of good stuff. So I ordered some oxidized glutathione from Sigma and added, and it turned out tiny amounts, 50 micromolar oxidized glutathione, in the presence of two millimolar reduced glutathione, was a potent inhibitor, and it inhibited exactly the same way. The, the, it was an inhibitor of initiation, and the ribosomes, or single ribosomes, all accumulated, and protein synthesis was shut off. So that was... That was very strange, and I, we, you know, I couldn't make any further sense of it because we didn't know very much about the, what the process of initiation of protein synthesis was. So I went back to Cambridge, not, not having had... I mean, I discovered these two interesting things, but I otherwise uh, it wasn't a terribly successful postdoc, I would say. And my uh, Irving, my boss, had decided to leave New York and go to set up a new medical school at MIT, which he did very successfully. So I was sort of rather left to my own devices. And I went back to Cambridge and there joined forces with Richard Jackson. Now, one of the things that Jim Watson says in one of his books is that a very good advice is always try to work with people who are cleverer than you are. It's really good advice. I cannot recommend it too highly. And Richard and I made a very good team because I was apt to sort of rather rush ahead with broad brushstrokes and, and Richard was very logical and careful and uh, it, it was a good combination. And we started working on this and the first thing we discovered, uh, 
And it came about, I mean, this is interesting, this is about the mechanism of initiation of protein synthesis. And it didn't come about as a result of studying the mechanism of initiation of protein synthesis. The breakthrough came as studying the regulation. So if you left out the heme, um, this is a really, I'm sorry, I should have explained what we're looking at. These are, I used to run hundreds, in fact, probably thousands of these things. So this is what's known as a sucrose density gradient. And this is the top and this is the bottom. And these are ribosomes and ribosomal subunits. So these are the single ribosomes. And I think you can see that this peak here is much bigger than this peak here because this, we've left out the heme, so initiation has been inhibited. And uh, we labeled these things with uh, S35-methionine because by then Richard and Tony had discovered that that's how protein synthesis was initiated. There was a special initiated tRNA that carried methionine. And one day we added some, left out the heme, added double-stranded RNA, and this funny peak here, we, people had noticed it before but hadn't realized its significance. They thought, you know, initiated tRNA is sticky. Well, it, well, it is sticky in a way, I suppose, but this is the small ribosomal subunit, and actually this is a pre-initiation complex, and when you, in all these inhibitory s situations, this peak of radioactivity went away, and importantly, it went away before protein synthesis curled over and died. So actually, this was really important to give rise. Here are polysomes, that, that's one, two, maybe a hint of a third, and you can see the radioactivity and new globin chains are all on the polysomes, but this peak here, going away. So, um, and we, we, this was a very important discovery and opened, opened the door. And then in 1974, the lab burned down. And uh, luckily, the graduate students had all just graduated. And it was a very hot fire. It was hot enough to melt Pyrex beakers and things like that. Unfortunately, I don't think there are any Pyrex beakers in this photograph. And you can see that not much was left of the lab, and this was absolutely the best thing that could ever have happened to us. Because we moved to new premises, where actually I think in this building here in Addenbrooke's Hospital, there was a man who uh, ran the hematology department. He had a teaching lab they didn't really use very much for teaching, and he very kindly allowed us to move in there, so that was good. But the key thing, we were opposite, this is the famous MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, which has won no fewer than 21 Nobel Prizes in, in uh, molecular biology. So I've shown you some of them already. And uh, what happened as a result of this fire? We, so, so we moved and we got all new equipment because of some kind of insurance policy. And all the old data, we, at that time, we, I'll show you, we were really pretty baffled by what was going on, and it, just everything was burned up. It was sort of wonderful, like sort of making a confession, you know, it's sort of new surroundings, new labs, new neighbors, wonderful stores, because Max Perutz, who ran the MRC lab, said we could use his stores. That was brilliant. And perhaps even more important, the, the canteen run by his wife, uh, but so we could have lunch with all these superstars. It was great. So here they are, you know, there's Fred Sanger and Francis Crick and Jim Watson and Max Perutz. But there are all these other people. So these are the sort of slightly older generation than me. And then there was me and my generation. And I think the interesting thing is that I don't think we would never have considered ourselves in the same league as these, these characters here. But actually, you know, it turned out in retrospect we were pretty good, you know, and um, we were just trying to solve all kinds of different problems, just following our noses and explaining to each other, discussing with each other how things were going and when we got stuck. And, and, and you know, it's not, it, it's funny, science is at the same time very, very difficult and also very, very simple. I, you know, if you, it's, it's hard, hard to explain until you've really done it. And at the time, we were terrible. Look at this. I mean, I'd, I'd forgotten about this, and I went back and looked at an old paper. A complete foggy confused. Some, an Israeli had discovered the fact that caffeine reversed some of these things. It overcame lack of heme, for example. Here's no heme in, and you add some caffeine, and um, you know, you can, you can reverse the inhibition. Well, why caffeine? So we then tried a bunch of other things like cyclic AMP, to aminopurine. You see, I mean, here, here, this is interesting. You see, heme regulation seems to be instantly reversible by adding the caffeine, whereas if you inhibit with double-stranded RNA, you add the caffeine here, 
there is a lag and then protein synthesis, and the recovery here is actually better than the recovery here. So, you know, what the hell does this all mean? Well, we didn't have any idea, really, and, um, you know, that's why it was good to burn up all these data, because it wasn't, it wasn't, help, wasn't really getting us anywhere. But again, you can see lots of rates, always taking samples at, at closely spaced time. I mean, I must say, this data is pretty good. I'm quite, I was quite impressed when I went back and looked at it. And s for whatever reason, I mean, we, I, I won't go into the, the whole logic because it's a little bit complicated. Uh, we discovered that what was going on was that all these things turned on a protein kinase, and this is a, 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 a sort of gel done for uh, a publication by my graduate student, Paul Farrell. And th th we're labeling proteins here with S35, with, um, sorry, with gamma P32 ATP, and I think what you can see is when you add the double-stranded RNA, this band here gets a lot hotter than it does here, and um, what we've got is a protein kinase. The, f the terminal phosphate of ATP is transferred onto a protein which changes its activity, and ADP is then produced and recycled. So here's an example of a protein which is dead on the left, and then you add a phosphate to it on the right, and it becomes active. So that's the kind of thing that phosphorylation, and all the, uh, you know, almost everything we do is regulated by phosphorylation. So we discovered that all of these three things turned on a protein kinase, uh, probably different protein kinases. In fact, we now know, this is years afterwards, that there are four of these enzymes, all of which inhibit protein synthesis in a similar kind of way. So the one, the double-stranded activated one is now called protein kinase R, PKR, uh, GCN2 is something that's regulated by amino acid concentrations in yeast. There's the heme-regulated protein kinase. And there's something called PERC involved in the unfolded protein uh, response. And it's sort of interesting, actually, PERC inhibitors. So, you know, when you have these dementias, it's very often because protein precipitates in your brain. And it turns out that what that does, actually, is to turn off protein synthesis in the nerve cells, and that turning off protein synthesis in nerve cells tends to kill the nerve cells. And if you inhibit this guy, r close relative to these other guys, um, you know, they, they, the protein synthesis is kept going, and apparently it shows some considerable promise for the treatment of some of these neuro... I, I, you know, I don't know whether this is panning out in, in, the, in the clinic or not, but it would be lovely to think that something I'd had a hand in the discovery of was actually useful, and since I'm just about to get demented myself, you know, it would be great to help. Anyway, we were rather pleased with ourselves for having... This was the first... There was a really important discovery, and it was a real case where before, you know, one day we didn't know what was going on, and the next day suddenly, bang, that was the answer. And then you sort of kick yourself and say, why the hell, what, <laughs> what took you so long? It's bloody obvious in retrospect, but it wasn't obvious at the time. And so we organized an EMBO meeting on the control of protein synthesis, and one of the people I invited was Tom Humphreys, who worked in Hawaii, on the control of protein synthesis in sea urchin eggs. Because having solved our main problem, the problem that had been exercising me for the last 10 years almost, um, what was I going to work on next? And I thought it might be interesting to study control of protein synthesis in sea urchin eggs, because this was a very clear-cut answer, a cut, a cut ex a, uh, example where you turn protein synthesis on. So we invited Tom to this meeting in Cambridge, and it turned out that he was a very keen cyclist and wanted to borrow a bicycle. So I lent him my bicycle, and we became friends because I lent him the bicycle. And it also turned out that he was the director of a course in Woods Hole. It was actually the embryology course. And he said, would I like the following summer to come to Woods Hole, help him teach, and we might be able to do some experiments on protein synthesis in sea urchin eggs. So I leapt at this chance and uh, went there the following summer and discovered it was very easy to get sea urchin eggs. Here is a poor female sea urchin eggs being subjected to a 12-volt current alternating current electric shock and um, she sheds her eggs. Uh, here's a male sea urchin eggs. You give him a 12-volt alternating current electric shock, and he sheds his sperm. Now, 
Guess what happens if you mix eggs with sperm? You turn on protein synthesis, right? <laughs> it was true, so that was, that was good. Um, but something much more interesting happens if you look down the microscope, because let's add some sperm to these eggs. Uh, they start dividing. And the divisions are amazingly synchronous. You don't have to do any, just mix the eggs with the sperm and, and the divisions are super synchronous. This, what's happening here, this is not an egg, this is an oocyte. It's the precursor of an egg and it can't be fertilized because it needs to go through meiosis in order to go. So, so that's, that's, that's very good. And then a couple of years later, uh, a guy called John Gerhardt, who'd worked out the basis of allosteric, how enzymes can be controlled um, by other compounds, came and gave a talk about frog oocyte maturation. So the, the frog oocyte, I've shown you one oocyte, a sea urchin oocyte, that's what you would find inside a female frog in the spring. These are the cells that are going to become eggs. But before they can become an egg, they have to be exposed to this hormone progesterone. And let me show you with this little movie, this is not a very exciting film, so watch closely. In particular, focus on that cell there, that oocyte there. So I add some progesterone. White spot forms, and then that little shudder actually is the first meiotic division. Uh, it's easier to see. You can't see inside frog oocytes. There's too much yolk there, but these are starfish oocytes. They don't respond to progesterone. They respond to a compound called 1-methyladenine. Um, but it's easier to see. So the, the oocytes always have this enormous nucleus because they've got lots of transcription factors and stuff stored away in them. Inside the nucleus is a little thing called the nucleolus, which is where you make ribosomes. There's a big stock of ribosomes. And if I add some 1-methyladenine, it goes pretty fast, this. You'll see the structure completely change. There you go. Phew. It just fades away. And then, ooh, little shudder at the end, which is the first meiotic division. And you, if you look, you see there, there, it's a very uneven division. So the egg throws out half of its DNA in a tiny, tiny cell. Okay, now I'm going to show you this. Is, these were both made by a friend of mine at EMBL. This, this, this is a really fantastic movie. So here's the nucleolus, lots of ribosomes which stain with this stain. Here are some chromosomes which also stain blue. The, this dye can't distinguish between DNA and RNA. Uh, microtubules are in red and the surface of the oocyte is in green. And again, I will add some 1-methyladenine and watch what happens. Nucleolus melts away, the chromosomes line up on the first meiotic spindle, which then, I love that, you know, and you can see half the DNA has gone out. I don't know what's happened to the, the half that should stay in, that's a bit mysterious, I've always wondered about this movie, but it sort of gives you an idea of what's going, it's quite complicated actually. So what Gerhardt described was the oocyte maturation in uh, frog oocytes, and uh, what uh, a Japanese worker had found a few years before, which was that what progesterone did was to activate an inactive precursor of an enzyme that catalyzes entry into M phase, in this case meiosis. And he discovered that by sucking out a bit of cytoplasm from a mature egg and putting it into a fresh oocyte, which then undergoes the same maturation reaction, now with no progesterone. And if you heated this material or treated it with protease, uh, proteases to digest proteins, it went away. So it had to be a protein. And uh, this is a picture of what you would find. That this is a little cartoon drawing of uh, chromosomes lined up on a second meiotic spindle. The question is, what was this substance? Uh, because that seems to be the key to entering uh, mitosis and meiosis. Because it was found... Uh, that the substance was terribly unstable. If you tried to purify it and characterize it, it just disappeared. So all you could do was show that it was always present in dividing cells and always absent in cells in interphase between divisions. And it wasn't just in meiosis, it was also in mitosis. So here, and not only in frogs, but also in starfish and finally in human cells. If you took, if you arrest human cells in mitosis, they have something in them that will cause frog oocytes to mature. Um, but what is it? 
Dunno, because you can't purify it. The minute you try to purify it, it disappears. So that was frustrating, but I thought, you know, what a, what a lovely problem. What a and I wonder, do, do sea urchins have MPF too? And we sort of started to, to, to think about that. And, um, but not in any very coherent way. And then, meanwhile, the problem of how you stimulated protein synthesis, remember, that was the real problem I'm studying, how you turn on protein synthesis after fertilization was not going well. And I read this book, Artificial Parthenogenesis and Fertilization, by a distinguished medical researcher called Jacques Loeb. I think this book was published in about 1905, something like that. And it had some interesting clues about how sea urchin eggs were fertilized. And I learned from reading that you could actually get virgin birth in sea urchin eggs by doing, adding sort of dilute soap solutions, ammonium ions, and later, more scientific, perhaps calcium ionophores, various various things. So, uh, and I think because of my religious, and my, both my parents were very devout, and I'm afraid I lost my faith as a as a as a teenager. But I, I I've seen an awful lot of pictures like this. Here is um, the Virgin Mary being fecundated by the Holy Spirit. So the idea that you could actually do molecular experiments on virgin birth, I think, rather appealed to me. So I did a very simple experiment to compare the patterns of protein synthesis in parthenogenetically activated eggs with properly fertilized eggs. And there was some reason to think that something went wrong in the parthenogenetically activated eggs, and I, I haven't been able to really reconstruct what that, what that was. So I did the experiment, and it turned out there was no difference, except there was one difference. Uh, and this is the experiment. So you take samples, you fertilize the eggs, and you take timed samples. And you've seen that I'm always taking timed samples, which is absolutely crucial, because this protein here, clearly labeled cyclin, uh, was one of the first, the strongest, most highly synthesized protein early on. It gets stronger and stronger, and then it faded away. And then it came back again, and then it faded away again. And it kept on coming back and fading away as long as the cells were dividing. And if you inhibited cell division with, it, with microtubule inhibitors, for example, then it didn't go away. So, wow, that's pretty amazing. And look at this. This is a, a better experiment. This is done actually a year or two later in clams. And it's really easy to see here, I think. There are two of these proteins coming and going and coming and going. And I knew that if you inhibited protein synthesis here, then the next division did not take place. So I sort of just stumbled completely by accident, doing a completely silly experiment on the secret of cell division. You make a protein that catalyzes cell division, and in order to complete the cell division, you have to get rid of it, because otherwise you'd be stuck in this sort of poised metaphase-like state. And the only problem was, I, I thought, well, you know, it, there's something wrong here because the cyclin concentrations go up steadily, but the appearance of MPF is very abrupt. So that doesn't, it's not quite right. Moreover, I mean, this looks like there's an awful lot of this stuff, but actually there isn't really. This is radioactivity. And if you calculated how much of it was, could there really be enough to catalyze cell division? I mean, that seemed like a thing that you you'd need quite a lot of to do. And so both of those things were, were worried, but what could we do except try and find out what cyclin was and what it did and how it, how it worked? And perhaps a more important difficulty that I, I confronted at this stage was there I was, I really knew a lot about the control of protein synthesis at the time. Um, and I knew that finding out about that control had involved making lots of stupid mistakes. You only really learn something, I discovered, by making stupid mistakes. And then hopefully not making that same stupid mistake twice. So you gradually learn and become a sort of great expert because you've made every stupid mistake you can possibly imagine. Well, going into a new field, and uh, this is a very complicated field, about which very little was known at the time, um, you know, I haven't made any stupid mistakes. I'm bound to make lots of stupid mistakes. It's going to be embarrassing. It's like sort of going back to school and being a beginner all over again. So 
but nevertheless, that had to be done because I just sensed that I'd stumbled on something that was really, really important, and it turned out that was absolutely true. So what do we know about the cell cycle? Well, uh, you know, there's DNA replication and there's chromosome segregation, and the whole point of the cell cycle is to make sure that the two daughter cells after division have a complete set of chromosomes and a complete set of DNA molecules. There are gaps in between, and there are sort of regulatory getting into mitosis is regulated, getting out of mitosis is regulated, and starting S phase is, is, is regulated. And, oh, I mean, you know, getting into mitosis is, is quite complicated, and it's a little bit hard to say whether it, there really is a sort of switch-like moment. But in higher eukaryotes, the moment where the nuclear envelope breaks down and you set up the metaphase plate is, does look like a real real sort of on-off switch, but there are things that happen before that. Which, and then the most magical moment is when the chromosomes come apart at the metaphase to anaphase transition, and you wait for about five to ten minutes before the cell divides into two, so that the two sets of chromosomes are well apart, and this division plane doesn't um, come down on, on, on the chromosomes, and then you have two cells. And it was known that, uh, you know, this was a very complicated process. And here's a review, uh, a generalized plan of the time flow of event. A lot of these are nonsense, actually. Um, and it's very, it's, I love this, synthesis of substances of the achromatic figure. That means spindle assembly. Chromosome reproduction. There's something about energy in here, I think. Yeah. Energy reservoir, that was also nonsense. Uh, so this was, this was the expert, uh, you know, but nevertheless, it's this which is interesting, the trigger. What's the trigger? Had I discovered the trigger? So, what is the trigger? Well, the, 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 the real pioneer in this field is Lee Hartwell. Uh, who had isolated mutants that couldn't divide and stopped at a particular place in the cell cycle. And he and his friends focused mostly on a gene called CDC28, cell division cycle gene number 28, because it controlled three very different kinds of processes. Formation of the bud, you see the formation of the bud that gets bigger and bigger and finally gets as big as the mother cell. Uh, initiation of DNA synthesis and something called spindle pole body duplication in, in higher organs, that would be formation of the mitotic spindle. And he was followed um, by Paul Nurse, who started out life as a biochemist and didn't like biochemistry very much. And Paul used a different kind of yeast in which it was easier to tell whether the yeast was growing by measuring the length of division. And what he found was that he too could isolate mutants that couldn't divide, they just get longer and longer and still they die. Here's a wild type yeast, a CDC2 mutant. And then he discovered by accident these wee mutants which divided a smaller than usual size. And he realized that these must be regulatory mutants because whatever this gene was, it really affected the size at division. And he lo went to look for other genes that could have a similar phenotype. And the only one he ever found and he looked very hard, was an allele of CDC2. So CDC2 is a gene that you can either turn on or turn off, make it more active or less active. So it had to be regulatory. And in his yeast, it seemed to control mostly entry into mitosis. Um, Lee's mutant, the CDC28, appeared to mainly control entry into S phase. But when the gene was finally cloned and sequenced, it was found out to be the same gene and, moreover, interchangeable between the two yeasts. So actually, the same gene controls entry into mitosis and entry into S phase. And, aha, it turned out to encode a protein kinase, judged by its sequence. But when you made the stuff in bacteria, um, it had no activity. So, Perhaps it wasn't a protein kinase. And, but when it was found in humans too, um, that really was pretty amazing. Um, and it was found by complementing a CDC2 mutation in, in fish and yeast. Because people had actually criticized, Paul then worked in a cancer research institute, and the director of the cancer research institute had been criticized, yeast do not get cancer. What the hell are you doing hiring a yeast geneticist? 
And when Paul and Melanie Lee discovered that actually uh, CDC2 was in human cells too, people realized that actually they'd been studying cancer without knowing anything about the control of cell division, which seems a slightly odd thing to do, and people shut up for a while and didn't criticize Walter Bodmer anymore, which is good. Now they do again, sort of, you know, because everything has to be translational. But sometimes you don't know enough to translate it. Anyway, so, but nowhere here, because yeast genetics doesn't tell you about proteins disappearing. So, you know, where was, where was cycling in all this? Well, the answer came slowly, and the heroes here, here's Paul with a glass of wine in his hand. Um, and here's my graduate student, John Pines, who was the first one to work on um, cyclins, and Jeremy Minshall, another, um, and I, I loved these two boys, they were great. Um, and John cloned sea urchin cyclin B, as it's now called, and Jeremy was able to show that um, uh, frogs had cyclins, and we cloned both cyclins A and B from frogs. And once we found that um, cyclins were present in frogs, I was very happy because frogs are, as far as I'm concerned, like humans. I mean, they have arms and legs and things, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that was very good. But what did, it, what did it do? Well, to cut a long story short, and again, we were incredibly slow because up to then, Protein kinases had been known had to have subunits that inhibited them, but there was no example of a protein kinase that required an activating subunit. And, you know, I mean, how, how idiot, why, there's nothing to stop this. Anyway, it turned out that cyclin here on the right was the activating subunit of CDC2. Actually, it's this loop of protein here which nestles on the surface of the cyclin, has to be pulled out of the way in order to activate the, the CDC2. So, it all sort of suddenly became terribly obvious. And again, you sort of wondered why it, we'd been so slow to think of that possibility. And again, it's because one tends to be so prejudiced by what you already know. It's really interesting. Um, so, you know, it's, once you understand what's going on, it's really easy. And MPF is just the thing that catalyzes this transition. And uh, the cyclin accumulates, turns on the CDC2, and the cell enters mitosis. Then you destroy the cyclin, which I should mention, um, I, I titled this talk, f f Seeing the Impossible. You see, at, at, the, at this time, it would, it would, it, people never even theoretically suggested that um, proteins could be degraded specifically inside cells because it was considered impossible. So because it was impossible, uh, nobody bothered to suggest it, but I saw it with my own two eyes. You see, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't miss it once you did the right experiment. Um, and I was just the lucky person who spotted this, so it wasn't impossible, it was possible. Not only that, I mean, other people showed it was necessary. If you don't destroy the cyclin, you get stuck in mitosis forever, and you die. Um, so you turn off the CDC2 and the cell exits mitosis. Very, very simple. And here it is, I mean, you know, this is a sea urchin embryo, and you see these wonderful, lovely metaphase, anaphase transitions going on all over the place. Doing, doing, doing. Yeah. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> so cool. I can't remember where I got this movie from. I love it. Anyway, um, so the moral of this story, uh, you can see it's sort of been quite a long journey, and you have made lots of mistakes along the way, lots of misunderstandings. And um, the point is that you just, you know, you, you never wear, you don't know where the road is going to lead. Once you go over the brow of the hill, it may peter out, it may turn to the left, it may go to the right, it may carry on. And I think, you know, what my advice to you was the important thing is just keep going and just follow that road wherever it leads because you really. If, you know, if you're working on something interesting, and I think it is important to choose interesting, you know, the interesting and important problems if you possibly can, but they also need to be crunchy problems. And uh, I think the problems I've, I've shown you are, are, are good ones, and it, finding those problems often took a very long time, and that was the difficult, the most difficult thing. And then to study them with your friends, uh, it's incredibly important to have good colleagues, also good competition. You know, it's nice to have scientific rivalries, and they've, they've, these form very intense 
respond. So, good luck to you all. Um, when do we need the next Nobel Prize in Hungary? <laughs> Just keep going. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, team, <laughs> for this wonderful lecture and uh, that you teach us how to win the Nobel Prize. And I hope that you, time will prove that you were today a successful teacher. And uh, on the behalf of the, our organization and the university and Seged, I just would like to give you a little diploma and a medal. Just remember your third visit. Oh, my now third visit, yes. In Seged, and hopefully this will be not the I last not one. The last, and thank yeah. you again for your lecture. Pleasure. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Fantastic. What do I have here? Oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> I love these things. It's a gigantic bronze plaque. <laughs> it's very good. And, and there is also a certificate. Let's see what the certificate says. Oh, you've got, I've already signed this thing. It's for me. <laughs> it has a smaller gold thing in it. Very good. That's lovely. Now, does anybody have any questions? Because I'm... Is there any time for any questions? Yes, of course. If I'm very happy to answer any questions, but I think a lot of people have asked me questions before already, so maybe everyone who's asked the question has already asked a question. Yeah? Wait a moment. Just please, uh, Where are oh, they? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep, this works. Brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs> there you are. So um, you said that so it's very important to choose the uh, an appropriate um, research topic. So if, when you start as an, as a new researcher, it's very important to uh, choose uh, a research topic that has a future and that might um, hold. Uh, very great promises. So, how? Um, what should we? What should you look for? Look for? Yes, yes, that's my question. Yeah. Well, I that that's very hard to say. Um, you know, one of the problems actually is knowing what is known and what is not known. I think, um, and sort of having the insight to realize that there's something wrong with it. You know, I mean, you could you. A sort of good example of a bad problem is what is consciousness, <laughs> right? Um, because how would you start? You know, what would what experiments could you do to find out what consciousness really is? It's, it's, it's not obvious. I mean, it's a good problem, right? But it's not a good problem to work on. So then you can have sort of lots of little. I mean, we we saw the the nice student um, presentations this afternoon. Uh, they, they had some rather more trivial problems. Was it possible to get this DNA inside these stupid methano, what's it, bacteria, right? Um, tricky problem. I mean, you know, if you can't do it, you can't do it, but there must be a way because somebody claims they've done it, so, and you have to have three strains. I mean, it looked very complicated to me. But if you did that, I mean, you wouldn't win enormous amount of you know, it would be satisfying, but it, you're not going to win a Nobel Prize for doing a thing like that, right? <laughs> so it's, 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 it, 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 it's sort of difficult. And if you look back, I mean, I quite, I, I used to like looking at the, sort of the history of biology in terms of Nobel Prizes, because they do tend to mark out sort of steps in understanding, and it's sort of interesting to look 
to see what they did. And then you can read their Nobel lectures and see how they, and almost in every case, they sort of, they didn't set out with that in mind. They just got led there by something in their personal history. And I think that's the way to go, really. So you've just got to sort of start out and you've got to put one foot in front of the other and go somewhere. <laughs> And I think a lot of people, I mean, I certainly made this mistake, was trying to be far too sophisticated to, to begin with. But it is very difficult to be. And I think it's more difficult today, too, because, you know, you look at almost any topic and there is a vast literature on the subject, you know, you, and you really don't want to work on something which there are already 10,000 papers. I mean, you could not read 10,000 papers in a lifetime let alone, you know, a year or two, which you, so, you know, I, 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 I'm jolly glad I'm not 20 something again, actually, because I think, I think you guys have it, you know, the tools are much sharper than they were when I started out, but um, finding, finding your way, I suspect is just as, I mean, maybe it's the same, maybe it's all this, always the same for every generation, you know, that it's, it always looks hard. I think it is hard to find a good problem to work on. So it's a very good question. Yeah, but I you. don't have a very good answer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, all right. This is the long and the short of it. Anybody else? Oh, whoa, right up at the back. Whoa. <clears throat> thank you for your very awesome presentation. And I have a question to how much luck was uh, needed to get the Nobel Prize? Uh, enormous amounts, <laughs> <laughs> I would say. I mean, in, uh, the, the luckiest thing really by far was that if you, uh, you I hadn't, didn't really point this out, but in principle the experiment that I did to show the disappearance of cyclin could have been done by anybody in the preceding 10 years, okay? Because the techniques were, were absolutely simple. And the only reason why they hadn't was because um, somebody looking at that, unfortunately, the, the two-dimensional gel had been invented in 1975 by Pat O'Farrell, and he, ran, he analyzed similar samples by 2D gels. And it just so happens that cyclins don't focus on 2D gels for some reason they never figured out. Moreover, um, nobody in their right mind would take multiple time points because 2D gels are a real pain in the ass to run, actually, and it's very difficult to, you know. And then, I mean, there was also, interestingly, my friend uh, Joan Ruderman and her um, graduate student, Eric um, Rosenthal, were actually working on these cyclins without realizing that they went away because they never did a time course. You know, they, they, they were, as far as they were concerned, translationally regulated proteins. Their synthesis turned on after fertilization of the clam eggs, but they never realized it went away because they never did this sort of really dopey, simple <laughs> experiment that I did. So, you know, I think the moral there is, or don't be afraid to do dopey, simple experiments. That's where you need to start. Thank you. Um, so I was just lucky. I mean, you know, anybody could have done it, right? I was so jolly lucky they didn't. <laughs> and uh, what do you mean? Can anybody get the Nobel Prize? Yeah, 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 I think so. I mean, you know, there are a lot of real dopes, <laughs> actually. <laughs> uh, I meant only Not the, all, of course. <laughs> only the uh, special man with special talent or... Uh, no, 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 nothing special. I mean, I, I think one thing I learned from these 21 Nobel laureates at the MRC lab was how variable they were. You know, some of them were clearly brilliant. Others of them were a bit slow. Um, and, you know, they came in all shapes and sizes. There's no distinguishing characteristic, I think, except I would say, I think, this sort of demand for, uh, to get at the simplicity, underlying simplicity of of biology. Now, I've no idea whether that's also true in chemistry and physics. That's a quite, quite different kind of thing. Um, and I don't know really, you know, I don't know. I, there's one physics laureate I know, the man who discovered quarks, who is uh, sort of interesting, a very nice man, quite old now. And, uh, you know, he, he began to suspect that there was structure inside the proton and they put out a grant application to look for the structure inside the proton. And the grant bo giving body said, don't be ridiculous, everybody knows that the proton is a fundamental particle and has no structure inside it. So the grant was turned down, 
but they sort of went on and did the experiments and with a more conservative kind of program in which they could examine this high energy portion of the spectrum, whatever it was. I don't really understand it. And, and, you know, there it was, and there was a sort of already a tenfold discrepancy between what the classical theory had predicted and what they actually saw. And then Richard Feynman turned up one hour and had been thinking about this and did some calculations, you know, and then they went back. And the, so, very interesting. I mean, you know, so you, people have inklings and go looking for things, and, uh, you know, but again, they're told that it's impossible. There isn't that, you know conventional, so always watch out for conventional wisdom. I think perhaps one of the most important lessons we were taught as Cambridge undergraduates was, and I've said this to other groups of you uh, already, you know, don't believe what you, what you read. <laughs> Find out for yourself, because very often, you know, what you read is actually not quite true. In textbooks, for sure, even in papers, you know, the results are probably true, but the interpretation may not be quite right. And it's sort of finding out when there are, you know, sort of, it's these paradigm shifts where you see the world slightly differently that often provide the, the ways of getting a foot in the door to, to solve a new problem. Okay? okay? Thank you. Anybody else while I'm back here? <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, how am I going to get to you? Oh, I know. How do I get in here? Is this, where's the, aha, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Here we go. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> who, want, who wanted the microphone? Yeah, you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, can I shake your hand? Yes, of course. <laughs> So my question would be, uh, do you continue to do any more research nowadays or do you focus more on hobbies and such? No, I, uh, I, I mostly cook, actually. Oh. <laughs> I'm really into Japanese cooking. Oh. That's very <laughs> nice. uh, no, I, st I stopped running a lab at the end of, I think, 2011. Because uh, I thought I you know, had had enough, really. And I think it's sort of a good idea to get out of the way, make room for you guys. Oh. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else over here? Yeah, if you can. There you go. Thank you very much. My question is that what do you recommend? So what did you do after um, finding out the cyclones? Did you uh, stay at this research area or did you change your research topic? So what do you recommend about this? Uh, well, um, no, I sort of, st I stayed with them for a long time, actually, because there are, uh, you know, there was a lot more to say, which I didn't have time mm. to say. Um, you know, one problem was that there were an awful lot of these bloody cyclins. There's <laughs> A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, T. I think that's how the alphabet goes. So what do they all... What do they all do? They're not all cell cycle regulators, but I think they're probably all kinase turner honors or something. And maybe not even all that, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it just gets too much, actually. Um, and one of the things that I also uh, only came to very late in life, in the last sort of five years, was uh, you may have noticed that, you know, okay, so you phosphorylate proteins and that brings about mitosis. But then how do you get out? It's not enough just to turn off the kinase. You have to also take all those phosphates off. And then if you think about that, you, know, how you take all those phosphates off, are they all being taken off all the time or is the regulation of the dephosphorylating enzyme? And I always thought there must be regulation of the dephosphorylating enzyme. And again, funnily enough, no one really looked at that. And then we, we were led back into it by a simple experiment and found out indeed very interestingly, they, there, there is a little module that turns the phosphatases on and off. So that was also very satisfying right at, right at the end of my research career. And having solved that problem, um, which I didn't think we'd get to, but we sort of did, um, I, I was very happy when I just uh, hang up my lab coat and <laughs> retire. Uh, uh -huh. uh. So um, 
you finished this and have you got another research topic right now? Not, not really, no. Um, one of the things that I've been doing since about 1985 is writing problems with my friend John Wilson that go along with Alberts et al, Molecular Biology of the Cell. And we're in the throes of a revision of that right now or a sort of slight reconfiguration of it. And that also is, I find, you know, it's very, it's an awful lot of work, but it's very satisfying. It's a very different kind of, different kind of work. Um, so I do that and I say I, I cook dinner. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, I, you know, I do think, I, actually, funnily enough, I mean, the, what I spend an awful lot, of, in the last couple of weeks, I've, I've I, I, you know, talking to young people like you is something I very much enjoy, and uh, I, I do quite a lot of. And so recently I've done it in both uh, Portugal and in South Korea. Very interesting talking to the South Koreans. I mean, I'm very impressed by all your English, actually. It's, it's uh, very commendable, very important, I think, Thank to be a good scientist. And, uh, it's impressive. Keep it up. Thank you very much and congratulations for all you have achieved. Thank you. Ah. I come down the steps. I'm terrified of falling over. <laughs> there you go. So I would like to ask um, your opinion. Uh, I would like to ask, do you think that, uh, is it nowadays possible to excel at more than one field of science? Whoa. Um, I d wouldn't say it's impossible, but I don't know very many people who manage to achieve it. I mean, I think, you know, really, in order to do stuff, you really have to focus in on one thing. That's, that's the problem. But of course, that one thing might be at very much at the interface between physics and biology, for example. I, I, I've had some interesting examples of people who have analyzed biological systems um, using sort of statistical physics as their mode of analysis. I think it's difficult, actually. I mean, I, I had one friend whose last, uh, he, he, he died not so long ago, um, who started out as a sort of theoretical biologist, and I thought he was, he was tr trained as a physicist, and he, I thought he was a bit naive to begin with. You know, they tend to try and make it simpler than really, but he, he being a very intelligent guy, he, he became very sophisticated in his analysis, and then finally was able to show that some very non-intuitive things came out if you really analyzed the situation properly. He was interested in somatogenesis, in um, zebrafish, you know, and produce really beautiful models and could predict what happens if you make certain mutations and they were pretty accurate predictions. So he probably really understood rather well what was, what was important about that process and what regulated it. But I think that's, you know, I don't know many people like that. Most of us aren't clever enough to, to, to go there. Okay, so, so you say that it's possible to, to make a fusion between two fields or, or something, but yeah. it's really hard to do. But it's, 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 it's difficult because, you know, I think that, I mean, physics and biology, I think, is a good example. A lot of people think that, you know, it would be good to have more physics in biology. I don't think anyone ever, ever said that it would be better to have more biology in physics. But <laughs> I like physics and biology very much. <laughs> well, then, you know, stick, stick with it. And the, the trick is that biology... Biology is sort of easy to learn, although, you know, I mean, the, the, the thing about physics is everything is very sort of fundamental, you know, you can work everything out from first principles in principle, whereas in biology you can't, you just got to do the experiment. Um, and, uh, but, you know, take the physics as far as it'll take you first, and then start learning some biology and applying it to that is what I, I think is the right way to, to go. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Anybody else want to move on this side? Oh, how am I going to? You'll have to pass it down the line. Thank you, Professor, for the amazing lecture. And uh, as a medical student, I would like to hear a little bit more about um, tumor and cancers and sickness. Uh -huh. What's the relationship? Especially after your discovery, the uh, 
they, they could monitor uh, really well with flow cytometry, cycling D1, mm -hmm. and uh, they discovered how much it's related to B-cell malignancies. And uh, were there any en enthusiasm, especially at the beginnings of cycling research, that uh, it's like a magic bullet against <laughs> cancers, and that's the only thing we need to understand uh, when we speak about uh, this wide uh, replication and, uh, and this uh, so my question is, how do you see your research and your discovery in finding the magic, magic bullet? Finding the magic bullet. Well, uh, I mentioned the, uh, you know, what happens if you stand the right distance from an atom bomb when it goes off, and you inhibit cell division, right? You die after about a week. It's an, in an incredibly unpleasant way, too. Uh, so it's no good just inhibiting cell division. You have to somehow inhibit cell division in the cancer cells. And there's the problem. I mean, people used to say, oh, you know, cancer is a disease of the cell cycle. I'd rather disagree with that, actually, because th there's nothing wrong with the cell cycle of cancer cells. They, if they couldn't divide, we wouldn't have cancer. But they can. They're very good at dividing, unfortunately. So I think the, the, the real problem with cancer is, you know, what makes those cells grow when their normal counterparts would not grow? It's the homeostatic mechanisms. You know, I once went rowing, having been very scornful about people who rowed. I thought I'd, you know, I'd been too dismissive and I ought to try it. And I was amazed that we went rowing and the, the skin on the palm of your hands very rapidly got thicker because you were abrading it so much, and that stimulated the, 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 the skin cells to divide. And when you stopped growing, it went away again, and your palms of your hands became softer again. So, you know, how does the palm of your hand know whether you've been rowing or not? <laughs> but it, right? And everything is like that. Um, normally, I think one of the biggest problems in, in, in biology to me is how things stay the same. You, you know, everything's turning over all the time. I'm not sure how often you have a new nose, but it's certainly, you know, you, not a single molecule in your nose now was present 10 years ago, for sure, right? But your, your nose is sort of recognizable yours. It's a, so, you know, that's a serious problem. And if you had cancer of the nose, which is not very common, but not wholly unknown, you would see that the, the, sort of the, the organization had gone all wrong and instead of just staying the same size, it started to grow and it sort of forgot it was a nose and the cells now grow faster than they die and therefore you have a, 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 a tumor. So, you know, it's understanding that kind of homeostatic mechanism, I think, and that doesn't really have much to do with cyclins and CDKs, I don't think. It has more to do with... Um, you know, growth factors and the Tor complex. It's very complicated stuff, actually, and I don't f claim to really fully understand it. On the other hand, there is a connection. You mentioned cyclin D, and cyclin D, CDK4, CDK6 inhibitors have recently proved quite effective in certain kinds of breast cancer. And actually, I heard a very nice talk from the guy who discovered this, um, whose name eludes me at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, they don't really know why it works. Why should it be anti, you know, and the, the problem with all these inhibitors tend to be that you get, um, you know, you, you get a deficit of white cells, if not of red cells. So the, the, the limiting doses are always that you wipe out your eosinophils or something, you know. So it, it, uh, getting the specificity of these anti-cancer drugs is very difficult. And in fact, we don't really understand, I think, why it is that uh, the effective ones work as well as they do. And, and chemotherapy is, is rather effective against um, lymphomas and diseases of white blood cells, but not very effective against solid tumors at all. So that has to do with triggering apoptosis, and that's another whole can of worms that speed I don't understand. Division, I think. Uh, the speed of the division. So, if it's so the I line. have a, not a question, just a suggestion at the uh, uh, moment that anybody can approach our guests during the gala dinner, but now we uh, we have to rearrange the stage for the program. And since we are a little bit in a delay, the uh, next program will start half past seven here. And thank you again for your
beautiful lecture and for you to attending this session.